that may be changing as um, obviously younger people become the predominant married age. So the three theories of emotions that I think go with this body, mind, or culture are very interesting. So I'd like you to review those on page 174 because those three models are the first one, A, on the page, is that the thinking is the way that we experience emotions is this. Something happens, an event, you experience an emotion, anger, jealousy, sadness, joy, and then your body responds based on whatever emotion you decided was happening. That's the first kind of thinking, and most of us would probably agree with that. Now, James Lang theory is different, and these are two physiologists that came up with a different, I'm sorry, it was one physiologist and one psychologist, and what came here, this theory says, this event occurs, my body actually responds. I'm not choosing the emotion, my body is responding, and then I determine what emotion that is and I experience that emotion based on what my body does physiologically. So I don't know the emotion until physiologically I respond. The third explanation, which we call cognitive labeling theory, you interpret your event first, so your event happens, and then you start to interpret it. When you're interpreting it, your body is going to respond physiologically first. So again, it's very much like the James Lang theory in that an event occurs and now physiologically my body's doing something. But the difference is now I'm going to decide what emotion I'm experiencing. I'm going to say, oh, what was that? Was that fear? Mm, was that joy? Is that anger? Is that annoyance? I'm not sure. And then you identify the emotion you're feeling. So there's a little bit more thought involved in the cognitive labeling theory than, say, in the James Lang theory. It's important to understand that emotions may be adaptive or maladaptive. And what that means is that emotions can help you adjust to situations appropriately. So, for example, if you feel anxious about giving a presentation, it may cause you to prepare more extensively for that presentation. However, if your emotions are maladaptive, that means that they'll get in the way of your accomplishing your goals. So if you're so nervous before you take a driving test that you hit a parked car, your emotions, that nervousness, have got, has gotten in the way with you achieving the goal of passing your driving test. The next principle is that emotions can be used strategically. And what does this mean? It means that sometimes we can use our emotions for our own personal ends. So that means, let's say, for example, I'm having an argument with somebody and I don't like where it's going and it's gotten very emotional and I just can't even communicate about it anymore. I'm just fed up to hear with all of the emotional drain that's going on and what I start to do is cry. And when I cry, that shuts down the communication, one. But two, it also now makes the other person go, oh my, this has gotten out of hand. I made her cry, and now I have to somewhat backpedal and be kind when maybe I wasn't because she's crying. And once somebody starts crying, I think most of us can agree that we'll back off a little bit. So that would be a strategic. Oftentimes you'll see children doing this, right? They cry to get their way. They throw a temper tantrum to get their way. And oftentimes I see parents giving into that and the child learns at a very early age that their emotions can be used strategically. And most of us would agree that we do at some point or another in our lives use our emotions strategically. The next principle that our emotions can be communicated verbally. We tell somebody I'm angry or they could be communicated non-verbally by folding your arms across your chest, looking away, looking down, huffing and puffing, things like that. So again, we can communicate them verbally and non-verbally. Sometimes we only communicate them non-verbally just to play the fun little game to see if people can guess what we're feeling, which is always a dangerous thing to do. Next is display rules, that our emotions are dis governed or affected by display rules. And what that means is what and what is not permissible emotional communication. So for example, display rules would be it is not appropriate to slap your child in public. 
it is not appropriate to punch another human being. It's not appropriate to slap another human being. It's not appropriate in an office setting to go into your office and slam your door. It would not be acceptable to um, roll your eyes at your supervisor. All of those things, those are display rules. You just don't do that. It's not even a question of, well, some people can do that. No, nobody would do that because if they did, it would have severe consequences and we would look foolish. We would not look emotionally intelligent. We would look emotionally unintelligent and most of us don't want to look that way. There's also gender display rules. For example, women talk more about feelings than men do, but again, it depends on the woman. It depends on the men. And I would also say that it's more acceptable for women to cry in public, but not for men. It doesn't mean men can't cry in public, but for the most part, men won't do that because it's a gender display rule that says men don't really cry. I remember um, when Hillary Clinton lost her race for, I think it was presidential candidate, she cried. Um, and not like weeping tears, but she shed some tears. And it was a very big deal because here's a woman who seems to be very tough and very hard-headed and strong, and yet she was tearing up. But we didn't think it was so unacceptable like we would have if, say, um... I'm trying to think of Mitt Romney, if he would have started to cry. That would have been a little bit strange, and we probably would have thought poorly of him had he done that, because it's a gender display role. Men can't or don't usually really cry, especially in a public setting like that. Emotions are contagious, and that's what we call emotional contagion. And what that means is when I come home from work and my 13-year-old son is playing a video game and it's making him very angry and so he starts to complain and get upset and go on and on and on about how it's unfair and he's frustrated and it's stupid, if he were to do that, it probably wouldn't take me very long to also be irritated and agitated and frustrated because his emotions are actually being transferred to me just because I'm in the presence of them. So you want to be careful of that. You'll see this a lot of time in marriages. One person comes home from work in a bad mood. The other person becomes in the same state just because they're around that person that's in a bad mood. So don't be the person that, that makes other people catch your negative emotions. If you want them to catch your positive emotions, I think that's good. But don't be the person that's having others catch your negative emotions. Last but not least, our last principle, emotions can have consequences. They can have positive, they can have negative consequences. It means that when we reveal our emotions, sometimes that makes us vulnerable to other people. If I were to come into a classroom and teach and start to cry in front of my students, they may look at me as unprofessional. They may look at me as, or view me as somebody who's not very put together. They may view me as somebody who, gosh, may have a, a, a difficult relationship in my life and I'm a communication teacher and I can't quite deal with it. There's lots of things that they would, that they would uh, maybe perhaps attach to that behavior. And the other type of consequences, think about things you've done at work that you've gotten reprimanded for, just having a bad attitude or being short with customers. Those type of emotional messages or emotional behaviors, it has consequences. So keep that in mind when you're making decisions about what you will and will not communicate about your emotions. It obviously does have consequences.